A child's death that has haunted the town of Pekin for the past year. On November 18th, 13-year-old Robert B. was reported as a runaway by his mother. However, we have been in touch with the Illinois State Police and are in the process of entering information of a missing or endangered person advisory. And what happened to Robert B. brought people in Pekin out to search for answers themselves weekend after weekend. Thousands of leads poured into the Pekin Police Department. The search for the teenager coming to a halt on a hot July day when his skeletal remains were found. Wednesday after Robert B. was uh, officially missing, Okay. he was walking along the railroad tracks. You specifically saw him? Yeah, he was actually walking on the railroad tracks by power, and it's a power company. Okay. Same tracks that lead right by where he's found. And so you told the cops this? Yes, and the officer who came said, yeah, it's probably not him. He looked around just a minute, and I said, I guarantee it's him. He's out here. And he refused to do it. Now he's probably in Peoria or down at Stanley's. It's a hoax. He's going to turn up. And yep, he wouldn't look. Now these railroad tracks are about an eighth, maybe a hundred yards from where the body is. Okay. It's, they're, it's, if, you, it's a, if you walked a straight line from where Robert is found to the railroad, it's kind of dense woods, very hard to maneuver. But there are trails that can get you into spots that are easier. You wouldn't take the straight shot. You would try to like get through Go the woods around. to a trail and then take the trail down to the water or to the railroad tracks. Well, you could take the railroad tracks to a trail to where Robert was found. To, uh, you could get about 100 yards without having to walk through hard, difficult woods. Or you could walk uh, on the road and come back out and go through the yard okay. and be right there. So it's real close. The tracks are not far from. So he's walking down these tracks. You said you saw it was right at dawn that you saw him? Right when the sun's came up, like 6.58, 7 o'clock that morning. Okay, perfect. And he, when you saw him, he was just kind of like walking around like nothing was wrong at that point? Well, he's heading south. He, like, the sun was just coming up, and uh, he was downwind of me, and I just heard something. He just, I don't know, instinct kind of turned around, turned around thinking, what the hell is the deer doing behind me downwind of me? And I realized as a kid, what the hell, is, this is not right. Yeah. Watch him go down the track south. Something told me to get out of the deer stand. Something's wrong. Then when I got home, I realized, shit, that's probably that missing kid. And that's when I called. And they would not go out there. But then detectives got a hold of me in January and asked where I'd seen them. And then they started looking. But yeah, didn't find them. Yeah, but I guarantee you the police department's got to have records. If you keep pushing and prodding, yeah, you're going to get somewhere. What in God's name are the chances that you see him half a mile from where his body's found. And I think my first reaction, and I'm surprised because he says he was never a suspect and the cops never came back and questioned him, but like, if you have a guy who says he saw the person that's missing point five miles away from where the body is found, how do you not go back in the future and at least question him harder just to make sure he's not a suspect? I don't think he is now, but like, I that's I have me a real hard time with it does it does become for me just kind of a like an ethical question of like so the police have stated several different times they've exhausted all leads they followed up seriously with every single tip they've done all of these things and yet now we meet this guy that flies directly in the face of that right it sounds like he gave them a very suitable tip it sounds like they had absolutely no care in the world about what it was that he had to say until it was very clear, like, it's the, it's the dead of winter. Why did we even wait till January? How come nobody, ha nobody halfway through December was like, you, you realize this boy can't live out here, right? Yeah. So it, it's just, it's an interesting conversation about what's actually happening on the police side of things. It's not like the community really just kind of turned their back on this. It just seems like the police made some assumptions about 
Yeah. Who who it is that that we're dealing with right now, so we don't have to worry about those things. It's like, right. well, why don't why don't you don't? Mm. And I think that's that's something that we've heard of several times. Is for a, a while now, the police were just like, yeah, he'll just he's over in Peoria or he's you know with someone. He'll show up soon. And it wasn't until like a couple months later that they were just like, well, he he still hasn't shown up. Why? Because he's a poor kid? Mm -hmm. Because he's from a poor middle class family? Right. That's ridiculous to me. Yeah. And then it was the whole issue about um, what kind of missing report to put out there for him. You can't do an Amber Alert because he doesn't meet the criteria. Um, you can't do um, certain kinds of they listed him as a runaway, then they put him as an endangered teen, all these different things, all because they didn't know who picked him up or if he was picked up. Right. And this upset me. I have five children. Okay, so you're gonna tell me my five kids go down to their bus stop down here in the morning yeah. and everybody's working and one of or two of my kids get snatched up and nobody sees it. Nobody sees who took them, nobody sees the vehicle. My kids will not be listed as an Amber Alert. Yeah. And I won't have an idea of who took my kids. It will not be listed, but they're going to be listed as a runaway or as an endangered teen. Yeah. That is not okay with me. After he went missing, what was the reaction of your family, the community? Um, well, his mom called us an hour or two after, after she did the news interview. So the news was live, and she called us as the news was on, something like that. And we, like, sped there. And we were like, we're going to go look for him. And she was like, well, I'm not going. I'm here. I'm going to wait at the house in case he comes back. And we're like, your friends are here just in case he comes back. You need to be with us and looking around peak and where you think he might be. She's like, I don't know where he might be. I don't know where he hangs out. I don't know this or that. I'm like, the park. Number one place, the park or the river. Yeah. Let's go look. So, yeah. Wow. That's crazy. And then there was someone potentially thought they saw him at Walgreens in East Peoria while we were there and in peak and we were, so we were like, let's go to Walgreens and see if it was him. We need to double check cameras and all this. And she's like, I'm not going. I don't want to go. I need to be at this house. We're like, you're going, you need to see if it's him and the cameras. Yeah, wow. Yeah, she refused to go. We finally were like, you're going or else like you have to go. Right, like, like, this that's is, not okay. This is your responsibility. Yeah, wow, yeah. it's crazy that you'd have to almost like twist someone's arm. Mm -hmm. I had to make Lisa that day get in my car with me and my daughter to go to East Peoria to try to identify a video. I took one look at the video and my son did and he goes, Mom, and I said, that's not my brother. Lisa goes, oh my God, my angel, somebody, he's gone now, somebody's taking him away. And after that whole hype on the news saying that he was already gone, I'll never see my angel again. She had just done that an hour or two prior we get to Walgreens, and she's jumping up and down, screaming and crying in Walgreens that somebody kidnapped her child. Wow. And I said, Lisa, you know that's not my brother. And I said, um, Keith, because we, we write and we write, we do a lot of the benefits and stuff, and he's like, do you need to come out? He goes, just walk with me. He goes, I know that's not Bonsai. You know that's not Bonsai. What did she do? That's crazy. That's telling, right? <laughs> and that's an East Troy police officer. That's amazing. Yeah, and I'm sure they... Well, he's transferred. He just transferred last year, at the end of last year, but he was an East Troy police officer at the time. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. He, he even said, what did she do? That's crazy. We both know. And my son came out of the room and goes, Mom, that's not bonsai. Well, because she kept saying that um, it was, even though he was a, a sergeant, they brought the chief down and they had to bring the guy and the little boy back to prove that it wasn't. And I looked at Lisa and she goes, oh. When they brought the kid in, she goes, yeah, that's not Bonsai. Just as calm as could be, just like her whole demeanor change. She goes, yeah, that's not my son. There's, we were looking everywhere. Like I had school and we were in the car until I put clothes in the car because I knew I was most likely going to be out all night. Yeah. 
So I slept in the car with my mom out driving, and I went to school in the morning like it was nothing. The townspeople got together and we started looking around, and then all of a sudden the police told us, well, you guys gotta stop looking. You're compromising everything. I was told by the police I couldn't go knock on doors yeah. to look for my son at all. Because yeah. I was going and knocking on doors and I was told by the police I couldn't do it. And who, you were just like knocking on neighbors' doors or yeah, people I'm, you thought? I was just going to people's houses and I was knocking on the door asking them if they had seen my son. You know, and I was told by the police department I couldn't do that. And when the police told you guys to kind of stop searching the areas, did people stop searching? Not most of them. Yeah. You know, but it made everybody wonder why the police was telling us that we couldn't search, why we couldn't knock on doors, Yeah. Uh, why they weren't going to get the dogs out. I even called to get like an airplane or a helicopter that would go around and do air searches that way, I was told I couldn't do that either by the police department. That's frustrating. Yeah. Like, especially because it's, I'm sure in your opinion, it didn't seem like they were doing much. Yeah, at the time, I got very angry, very peed off at the police department, and I lost all hope of the police department for doing you know, finding my son because they weren't doing enough. Yeah. The month after Banzai went missing, it was like December, the end of December, early January. I had went to visit my stepdad's sister. Mm -hmm. And my, I had overdosed, my skin was completely gray. Yeah. She took me to the hospital and told him, I guess, that I tried to kill myself. So while I'm, while they're pumping my stomach out and everything else because of all the drugs I did, after that they took me straight up to a psych unit at Methodist. Yeah. And then I was there for nine days at Methodist on the psych unit in January. And then from there I went straight to Jacksonville for drug rehab and I was there for about 30 days. Hey everybody, I am in my sober living house and I am 38 days clean and sober today. So I want everybody to know that I'm still not completely well, um, but I'm getting there. Um, it's a rough road. I moved to Springfield. I'm living in a sober living house, you know, to get myself together. Because I have to take it day by day, you know, second by second, because the cravings are still there. You know, there are days that I never know if I'm going to wake up and I'm gonna want to use you know I'm so depressed there are days that I still want to hurt myself people don't have to go through what I go through every day not knowing where you kid is at, not knowing if he's coming home, you know, I remember the last thing he said when I went to the school and I talked to the principal, is he... He told the principal he was running away from home and never coming back because his dad was mean to him. That thought is stuck in my head and I can't get it out. My heart breaks every day.
but all I want is him to come back. So not only at this time was Lisa creating Facebook Lives, but Steph, Bonsai's sister, was also making some videos. Bonsai, it's sissy, baby. Please get a hold of me. I'll do whatever I have to do to get all this cleared up for you, honey, and keep you safe. I always have in the past, and I will now to this day. Remember the promise I made you. I would always love you and keep you safe and not let anybody hurt you, love and protect you. And I'm willing to do that to this day. Somehow get a hold of us. Let us know, me or Kenny or Kiera or Cody, let us know that you are okay, that you are not being hurt, that you are warm. Let me get meds back to you, something. Um, I haven't slept in days. I'm out searching for you now, kiddo. You have a home with us also. You know you are will be safe with us and you know I will fight for you like I have in the past. I've had you for months on end and I kept you safe last time and I will do it again, baby. And if you do not want to go back, you know you don't have to go back. Please just contact Sissy. Let me know where you're at and let me know you're okay. Somehow get a hold of me. I love you, brat. Did you feel like between the time that he went missing and the time he was found, there was a lot of searching going on? And if so, what did that look like? Oh yeah, people were out. People were out in droves. Yeah. You know, uh, droves. Uh, they uh, were out, uh, you know, just community members were out looking. Yeah. You know, I know there were vigils, people were praying. Um, I'm sure in the churches, you know, there were prayer chains and that Absolutely. type of thing going on. Even I, when I drove, I, I lived in uh, South Pekin at the time, and I drove Illinois Route 29, and I would cut through um, Cook Street mm -hmm. uh, going home sometimes, yeah. and I, because of the boxcar Willie thing, I would drive, it's just a few blocks from his house, I would drive through Cook Street, and I would always look up the railroad tracks and think, you know, maybe looking for shelter, he crawled up in one of those box cars that are always parked there. Oh yeah. That were open. Absolutely. You know, and I knew people had been up through there searching. Yeah. Do I curve around here? Yeah, you just follow this road all the way. What does it feel like almost three years coming back out this way? I just hate it and I've got cold chills and sick to my stomach. This was TAPS, right? Yeah, that's okay. where we did the initial search with state and Pekin police. But, um... Was that in January? Yeah. Yeah, that's crazy because the bow hunter saw him on these tracks right back here, supposedly five days after he went missing, which is crazy. So when you got, you said you had 60, 70 people out here searching? Oh yeah. What, everyone was just kind of like walking through the whole field? We all spread out, yeah, okay. we all, we all spread out and we all walked. I mean, we started on this line and we wow. just walked. Just trying to get a thorough feel we, for the whole space. We were over here for a good five or six hours that, and I mean, you gotta figure, it was so hot. Yeah. It was so hot out here. I mean, it was, it was hot. Oh, I can only imagine that time of year. We had backpacks. I mean, we were lugging backpacks out here with um, water in it. We had to sit down, I mean, so many times, but we kept going and going and going. It was just never ending. Yeah. But what is so crazy is that, you know, you always follow your gut. Yep. I never left this area. Yeah, it seems weird that I everyone never, was so drawn towards it. I never went it's spooky on any other searches. Yeah. I'd come out here, me and one or two other girls, just us girls. We would come out here and stay out here for hours, just walking. Yeah. 
just looking any little piece of anything. So I think one of the things that's amazing about this story is how the community kind of came together and really helped search uh, regardless of them being told not to or being novices at searching. They, I mean, I feel like they actually like organized search parties and got water and granola bars and people to donate stuff. And even where I saw a Facebook post where they were like, wear orange, you know, cause the hunting season was going on. And I thought that was like amazing. I think the, the community response was a little kind of that vigilante hero-esque in which they've been told, don't do something, don't do something, don't do something. We're trying to take care of it. And the general response is that we don't, we don't see you guys taking care of anything at all, so we're, we're going to try it ourselves. Yeah. And, and it sounds like it wasn't just one singular person organizing a bunch of different searches. There were several different small groups that kind of took it upon themselves to start organizing themselves, to start pushing every single day that they could to go out, search this area. Next week we'll move to another area. The week after we've got another area scheduled. So it was, it was really kind of, despite all the discord on social media, it was also really kind of cool to see just the amount of different people that were, I'm, I believe they were a majority of mothers and, and women that just seemed to just step in and organize the shoot and had no cares about where it took them and hours walking through fields and, and stuff like that. Yeah, and I even had seen on the Facebook groups where they, um, not desperate pleas, but they were pleading for people to come help them. They were looking for people who were even like more advanced in searching and who had knowledge or how to do it or what's appropriate, where they're consistently making pleas. And at some point it appears that they even got an outside group, I think it was called Trucks for Kids, to come out. So I think there were probably, when the cops had decided that this wasn't search worthy yet because of the fact that he's listed as a runaway, I think you see the community band together to be like, hey, we don't, we don't agree with you and we're, we're gonna look, you know? This is a 13 year old boy who had seizure issues. Uh, we are not gonna stop looking. And I think that's what's really amazing is despite all that, they, they continued on on really hot days. People were getting sick. Some people I've heard from said that their relationships fell apart because they wanted to go out searching every night and their spouse or significant other was getting frustrated with them. And, and these people were like, no, I'm still searching despite all of the hardship it might even be causing me. I, I think it's, it's a very interesting story at this point, just with the searches, the amount of time spent on, on looking for a little boy that I would say 99% of the searching volunteers probably have never met. A lot of public concern, the police department was getting tips, uh, so many of them that, uh, 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 that they tried to pursue them all. Um, it's a lot. <laughs> you know, and, and finally, finally they put out a, a, a statement saying, um, we're not asking you not to call if, you know, but we don't want unreasonable tips uh, 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 basically that uh, are based more on speculation than, than, mm -hmm. uh, than observation. Yeah. And uh, because it's just we're getting too much. Well, after about five, six months that, uh, you know, that flow began to ebb. Oh, yeah. And, uh, um, but yeah, I, I would receive a number of phone calls myself. Uh, one man uh, was convinced that uh, Robert was buried behind a church. Wow. Uh, where a, a certain uh, minister had had uh, a history of uh, supposedly of uh, pedophilia. Wow. Okay, and, uh, and he was going to go over there himself and take a look. And I called the police and said, yeah, we're aware of that. Oh, okay. Okay, <laughs> we're aware of it. So uh, he wasn't found there. I think it's interesting how everyone talks about the amount of tips the cops got. And Mike's mother even talks about how many tips he got or Colin he's got. And since we released the first episode, I would say we've probably gotten over 200 tips. And I know the cops even at one point were like, you know, no tip is too small but we're finding that even some of the really small tips are helping us put together this puzzle. 
So what I'm really wanting to do is encourage people if they do think that they know something or even if it's something small to, you know, feel free to still call on those tips. It's still really surprising. Someone calls and they're like, oh, I know you've already heard this and I know this isn't important. And then they tell me and the tip is not something I've heard before. So, you know, I want to encourage people, you know, don't, don't be shy. If you feel like you know something or have a tip, just send an email. If I've already heard it, I'll just, you know, say thank you. But maybe if I haven't heard it, maybe we can talk further to to find out what you know about that. What was your interpretation of the reaction of the community when Robert went missing, or do you have an opinion on that? I think there was a lot of good people that were doing good things by going out and trying to find him. Mm -hmm. But I do believe that there were some bad people that was also causing more harm than done. Yeah. And, and how did you get that impression, just through the different social media groups and stuff? Or what made you think that? Because that's probably not a normal thing someone would just think, but it does seem to be what was happening. Just by the comments that were going on on some of the pages, mm -hmm. I mean, when Robert's own mother wouldn't even get out and look for him, mm -hmm. a lot of the other moms thought it was their duty when they didn't have to. Yeah. And there was a lot of misleading information that was leading them all in the wrong places. One woman <clears throat> was arrested and charged with obstructing justice because she called the police department in January or late December, uh, about six weeks after Robert's disappearance, and said that she saw him entering a house in Manitou, which is about 30 miles south of, uh, of Pekin here. Mm -hmm. And uh, then she, uh, and, and that prompted a police uh, response. Uh, I don't know if they obtained a search warrant, but they, uh, they, they uh, deployed uh, uh, officers uh, from the state and uh, uh, local, Pekin went down there. And then this woman uh, blithely uh, got on the internet and uh, social media and said, I falsely told the police that I saw him going to that house because I think that that house is connected. God. to the case, and I want them to search it. That's crazy. So she was never prosecuted, but she was uh, uh, initially uh, booked on it uh, for obstruction of justice, and, and that, the police chief was none too happy about that. Oh yeah, it doesn't help anybody. No, no. Yeah. So I mean, she had flat out admitted it, so. Wow. Uh, yeah, it's been that kind of crazy case. The tips were coming in, you know, mm -hmm. hundreds of tips, and people were trying to help. Um, the best that they could. Absolutely. Unfortunately, those tips are dried up, and I think when the police, uh, when the, the public do, don't hear about the investigation as much, mm -hmm. they start to think the police are not doing Absolutely. their job. Absolutely. They were not doing anything. They didn't have cops out there doing investigations, nothing. Mm -hmm. My question was to the town hall, like to the police officers, why aren't you out there? They said that they didn't have enough um, financial support or they didn't have enough officers to go out to do investigations, really. And I can't tell you how many times I went down town hall and threw a fit about it. Yeah. In fact, I walked out of the one town hall meeting, I left my wallet in there, and then one officer came out, he's like, I just want to let you know, we really are going out there and investigating. Mm -hmm. Okay, but I don't see it. Yeah. I'm the one out there searching the woods. I'm out there getting sick and searching beds and digging and searching. Where are you? Because I don't see you. Yeah. But there are two departments working on this now. When the body was found um, outside of the city limits, then the sheriff's department and the Pekin Police Department are both working on that case. Yeah. Um, I know from experience uh, in 30 years working with those two departments, you know, those are two dedicated departments. Absolutely. And I'm hoping somebody here will, um, you know, see this and maybe something jog their memory. I mean, the police have an extremely bad rep by the public. When I started mm. this, I'm very pro-law enforcement, and many and many things we've worked on, and it hasn't been a ton already, but many things we've worked on, I've actually been blown away. I've actually okay. been like, holy shit, you guys are killing it over yeah. there. But some of the discord with the community, I finally felt like, at this point, I'm having to start to take a as legitimate issues um, mm. from... Uh, when the searches started, there was public posts um, from both the mayor and the police uh, 
community in Pekin to that people should stop searching. Mm -hmm. um, there was things put out saying people shouldn't be worried for their own families, yet they, they're also not able to provide an answer. Do you think that's, that's kind of creates some discord when someone's like, oh, no, no, your family's fine, but we don't know who did it? Yeah, I mean, I think I can certainly understand why people feel that way. Um, in terms of like the police involvement in the case, I don't really just because I wasn't here, I can't really mm -hmm. say like um, I, I haven't done any reporting on it, so yeah. I don't know. But I could certainly understand why people would. I mean, as a journalist, you're always sort of like that to question authority is part of the the uh, intangibles of mm -hmm. the job. So yeah. when that question is posed like that, like, don't worry, like everyone's safe but the person hasn't been caught I certainly understand the human nature of being like is that the case right <laughs> really? are we really safe and they I think a lot of the people even in the Facebook groups who have been trying to the amateur sleuth on the difference sure. I think a lot of them even just want to know what uh, you know be and I think that's part of it is is the cops you know and rightfully so cops need to hold stuff close to their chest because sure. it's, it can't we can't tell everybody everything because sometimes that will allow you to not be able to get to the answer but yeah. I think that that's part of it is the silence and and the cops probably are just doing it for their own reasons they probably have great reasons for doing it but mm -hmm. i think the public takes that as like you're not doing anything you're not looking into this you're not and so i think it yeah. kind of recreates a discord there even more so and where conspiracy theories come in or you know uh, was a cop related to somebody or something <laughs> where people are all of a sudden looking into like why you know sure you know a lot a lot of tips came in a lot of tips but as seth Rainey said we can uh, the, the lieutenant covering the case, uh, uh, you know, we'll follow uh, everything we can, but, uh, well, as, as Don Baxter said, we're still at the same spot yeah. that uh, we were six months ago. So there was a search that went on two days prior to Robert's body being found. It was called Trucks for Kids. I don't know when this red tote was found. And when I say red tote, I'm... I'm, from what I've heard now is what I'm thinking it is, is a red plastic tote, like one of those big totes. Like a storage? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I usually see them in like gray and blue, but... Right. So that's what I'm picturing. Um, at first I was thinking like a bag, like some right, sort of yeah. tote bag. I, that's how I would describe the tote. Usually. Yeah, and so when I was first told about this, and I thought it was something completely unrelated, like someone had found it, it had some weird things in it, but... But I think it might now, from the latest story I heard, it might actually have played in. My understanding was I heard that there was a jawbone and teeth found in the tote. Interesting. Along with some other things. I don't know what those things were, maybe clothing or something right. like that. Well, if he was in the tote, like that could have been kept somewhere and then someone was like, I need to get rid of this. Right. Or I know there's searchers going out, I'm gonna put it right in their path. So then I just think it's strange that that search happened and then two days following it, the skull is found. Like, what were, that is some weird coincidental shit there. And then how yeah. all of a sudden did the skull show up in the yard when it was probably on the other side of the fence? Mm -hmm.